Watch, please stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. Our scripture comes from the um, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 18, if you want to um, follow along in your Bible. The Lord calls Samuel. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of, the God, of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of the God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call him. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the ti other times, Samuel. Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family, from the beginning to the end, for I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sins of he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Israel, Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by the sacrifice or offering. Samuel laid down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What is it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. This ends the reading from the word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to mention uh, we are uh, striving to have the best nursery services in the area. And as part of that, our nursery team is going to be meeting uh, after this service over in the Fellowship Hall. If any of you would like to uh, meet and talk about the nursery and uh, our improvements and other things we might be uh, doing to meet our goals, I invite you to come. This is the fourth in a sermon series that is entitled Life Lessons. Uh, in our first week, we remember the story of the wise men traveling across the Middle East. You all remember way back then, way back after, after Christmas. It seems like a long time ago, at least, at least to me. Uh, we're now in February, and that was the first week of January. Uh, they traveled for weeks though, across the Middle East to worship at the feet of Jesus, and we remembered that first life lesson as being one that not only called us to worship, but also to place Jesus in our identity as disciples at the core of our being and doing to place who we are as Christian disciples at the core of our being and doing so that those things we think and say and do flow out of that Christian self. In our second week, we fleshed out that thought a little more as we remembered King David's greatest and most flagrant sin, one that included not only lying but also adultery and murder as well. And equally as important, we remembered that after his sin, and after his recognition of that sin, he turned to God in confession, which was accepted. And then thereafter, he lived his life as God's disciple, forgiving himself as well. And we talked about that second life lesson from the example of David as being that a critical component 
of our identity as a Christian and disciple of Christ is to also live out of God's love and mercy for us, to forgive ourselves as we have been forgiven. No matter what our sins, our mistakes, our shortcomings, our faults. It, indeed, that word repentance, turning around, that we so often apply only to sin, for centuries meant to turn around from, in essence, beating yourself up, to turn around from your flaws, your shortcomings, your mistakes, in addition to any wrongdoing, and live as God's child. Last week, we heard about Jeremiah's unusual purchase of land. And it was unusual in that he purchased land that was in enemy territory. Uh, Israel was in the process of being overrun by the Babylonians. And we described our life lesson from that as holding on to hope, even in the worst of times. And the reason for that is, is not that things will always turn out well in the next moment, but that God's future when God is victorious is always coming into that present moment of our lives. And in that present moment of our lives, no matter what, we are called to be faithful, uh, loving, and hopeful disciples of Jesus Christ so that we live into that future each day with faith and hope and love no matter what the circumstances are. And today we remember together the story of another person from the Old Testament, a woman named Hannah. And we talk about the lesson that her life gives to us, that of the gift of prayer. As we do so, let us begin with prayer. <laughs> Holy God, as you know, we often struggle in life. There are highs, but there are also lows as well. In each, you give us lessons to learn, lessons to open and grow closer to you. And we pray that you be with us today, that we might hear your word, even if it is not spoken by me, but that your disciples might hear you, might come to know you better, and might serve you more fully as we each go forth today. Amen. Uh, my favorite writer is a woman named Anne Lamott, and she has just come out with a new book on prayer that is entitled Help Thanks Wow. Help Thanks Wow. To her, those are the three basic prayer. Help, thanks, wow. And you can understand why that is. We've each had times in our lives when we were yelling out, help, and we've each had those moments in our lives when uh, things are going well when we have married the right person, as I thank God for every day, we go, thanks. And maybe we've each had those moments in our lives when we look out at the sunset or the sunrise or the mountains or the beaches or something else in life and we go, wow. Help, thanks, and wow. Those are our three basic prayers in life. As I was uh, reading uh, that book, it occurred to me uh, how profound it was. But then Mari uh, came home Thursday with a book that she had purchased. It's entitled Prayers for Boys. She's going to be uh, in her second. She, she bought it for our, our grandson, uh, Caleb. Caleb's 18 and 18 months. And uh, <laughs> so we, we hope that he profits from this. But I opened it up. And I was completely humbled by its insights. Someone once said, uh, all, I, all I needed to know I learned in kindergarten or something like that, and that there's a truth in that. Uh, praying with God is like speaking to a friend. As you get to know him, your problems will end. You can pray anywhere in your bedroom or the bath. You can pray outside or inside in the playground or the park. You can pray when traveling in the car, riding on your bike, or when looking out the windows at the stars that shine at night. You can pray when you are running, being still, or being cool. You don't need long words. Anything will do. You can pray in the morning or at the end of the day. 
whenever time it is, God hears all you have to say. Pray with eyes closed or open, standing tall or head bowed. You can pray by just thinking or saying words out loud. And as I uh, read through that, it occurred to me, as it probably should every week, that there was likely nothing new or novel I could say today about prayer. And uh, that thought was reinforced because I went to Amazon.com. Does anybody else have an Amazon.com addiction? That one click and, and it's yours. Uh, so I went to Amazon.com and I typed prayer into the book search engine and 81,000 titles came up. 81,000 books about prayer. And that made me realize that over the course of history, Christian history, only God knows how many sermons or courses or seminars or retreats have been held about prayer. So indeed, I will say nothing new in the next few minutes. Your fears have been confirmed as have your weekly thoughts probably. Whatever efforts we make during the next few minutes will only be to remind ourselves first of the basic impulse to pray. There's something basic about that. And second, of God's openness to prayer. And third, of the need to share our deepest selves in prayer. And we're going to filter those three goals of the impulse to pray, God's openness to prayer, and sharing our deepest self in prayer through the example of Hannah's life, but also, if you'll indulge me, through a little bit of, of my life. And it's not that my prayer life stands out in any way separate and apart from anybody else, but it's just that it's one Christian's testimony about the importance of prayer and the place of prayer in, in his life. And others of you have testimony I know. And I hope that today, if you have time in Sunday school class or in some other small group, that you might share your testimony about the importance of prayer in your life. And how it came about to be important in mine was that uh, only two short decades ago, it's actually 22 years now, I was caught in my own hell. And it was a hell of self, and it was also the hell of, of non-belief. And God saved me. Now, I hadn't done literally anything, anything at all. <laughs> so my life changed. It was kind of like St. Paul's. It was just in a flash. It was one moment I was looking at life and living life in this way, and the next moment I was reoriented to look at life or begin looking at life and begin living life in another way. It was, it was that quick. And truly, it was nothing that I did. The next step in my new life, right after that moment, was to begin to pray and to begin praying regularly. And again, it wasn't anything I did. Indeed, a Methodist pastor uh, rather inexplicably showed up at my house one day and uh, I, I probably stared at him dumbfounded as I opened the door like oh no you know like you might do if a Methodist <laughs> right if a Methodist pastor showed up who wants me to do something you know cook a casserole or attend a committee meeting or I don't know so anyway and he gave me the then current edition of the upper room which is still in publication, and this probably would have been the November, December 1991 edition. And I started praying with that little book the next morning and have been praying daily uh, ever since. And thinking back over those two decades of prayer, as I reflected on it, the most startling thing is that God has used prayer to change me, you know. I thought I was checking something off the God list, probably. And, 
But in fact, God has used that time to change me. You know, I was thinking I was worshiping God or I was uh, showing my devotion to God and, you know, being a good boy, reading the Bible, sharing prayers, petitions, confessions with God. But what was most important about that time is that God was using the openings there in my life, which were few, to work in me and to slowly over time, you know, change the way I think and the things that I think and say and do. Now, those of you who have been around me for any time at all know uh, I'm a man of many shortcomings and my days of sinning are not over. Uh, I hope there are no members of the SPRC committee here to attend to hear that. But my testimony to you about my prayer life is as long as you were open to God in prayer, God comes into your life in subtle and profound ways, and you are changed. So to me, prayer is not optional. In Matthew 6, Jesus talks in part about prayer. And he says, you know, when you pray, don't do this, but do this. But the important thing is he says, when you pray. He doesn't say, if you pray. So in other words, Jesus rather assumed those who were following him would pray. It wasn't an if, but a when. And if you do pray, it does open little cracks for God to come into your life. And when God came into my life that night, it was sheer grace. I wasn't seeking God or doing anything else. For Hannah, it was completely different circumstances. Uh, you didn't hear Hannah's name in the verses that Bonnie read today, but what you were hearing was the God's claiming of her son, Samuel. That was her boy that God was calling in those verses. A, a boy she never expected to have. See, years earlier, Hannah was married to Samuel's father, Elkanah. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now, Samuel was not even a glimmer in Hannah's eyes back then wasn't a glimmer for years into her marriage. She and her husband had tried and tried, but she was still uh, unable to have a child. Now back then, those things were always assumed to be the fault of a woman. And not the fault of a woman because of a physical issue, but the fault of the woman because she was a sinner. She had sinned. So Hannah felt not only the sorrow of being without a child, but she felt the eyes of the judgmental looking at her, the believers of the day, if you will. And she very likely felt the eyes of God judging her as well. Hannah, you are not worthy. You have sinned. Now. In her instance, those feelings of personal sorrow at not having a child and guilt at maybe having sinned and being considered by everybody in God a sinner were made even worse. Because you see, that was the time that polygamy was practiced in Israel. And her husband, Elkanah, had another wife, a very fertile wife who bore children. And that other wife regularly mocked and belittled Hannah for failing to do the same. Have any of you ever felt deficient in the eyes of God or in other people? Maybe even your own. Well, irrespective of the baby issue, you understand a little bit about what she was feeling like if you have felt that sense 
of deficiency. So whenever she rose in the morning, or worked or played during the day, or laid her head on the pillow at night, her failure was before her. It was before her daily because it was in that, that house with her. It was in the other wife's words. It was in the sounds of the children playing. It was in the judgment of the people and the culture around her. It was in God's eyes, and it was probably in her eyes as well. And the Bible says, though, that one day she prayed. She was at the old temple. This is the old, old, old temple. It was back in the days of Israel, before King David, before Jerusalem was capital. It was a place called Shiloh. The old, old days. And Shiloh was the worship center back then. And Hannah was standing outside of the temple at Shiloh. And her suffering was pouring over her soul. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9, and the following verses say this. Hannah rose and presented herself to the Lord. So she's standing. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. O oh Lord of hosts, if you would only look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget me. If you give me a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite, which is one consecrated to God. So, you know, she's bargaining in her misery. And it turned out that the old priest Eli, and you heard Eli's name mentioned in the reading today, the old priest Eli was watching her as she prayed. And she was praying in such a way, standing there, I don't know whether she was swaying or not. The Bible says she was praying silently, but her lips were moving. But whenever it was, Eli thought she was drunk. And he told her not to make a drunken spectacle of herself. Here, here's maybe one new thought you haven't had on prayer. It's okay to make a spectacle of yourself. So she said... No, my Lord, I'm a woman deeply troubled. I've had no drink. I've been pouring out my soul to God. Don't regard me as a worthless woman, for I've been praying out of my anxiety and anguish. You know, praying for a son. You know, and just as you and I have, praying that prayer helped. You know, praying that prayer of relief. And God heard and God answered. The young man Samuel, who you heard about in the scriptures, was born about nine months later. But to we who are here this morning, the thing to stress is not God's particular answer to her prayer, but the three things we talked about earlier. The human impulse to pray. Help, thanks, wow. I think there's truth in the title of that woman's book. Hannah's prayer was, of course, help. There's something basic about that. You know, even the purest atheist will yell, help, in time of need. Or, thanks, in days of gratitude or moments of blessing, or wow, in awe or wonder. So don't deny yourself that basic impulse or bottle up that impulse to pray. It's there and it's there for a reason to come out of you. And second, as you pray, remember it's a testimony not only of Hannah and not only of scripture, but of hundreds of thousands and, and even thousands of years now of people who pray that God is open to us, and God does hear, and God does answer, even if the answer is not what we want, or even if the answer is wait. And pray too, because if you want to put it on a selfish basis, as you open yourself to God, God has more room to bless your life to shape and mold you 
as one of his people. And third, what we most learn from Hannah is that when you pray, pray from your heart and your soul and your gut, your pain and your anguish or your joy and your thanks or your awe and your wonder. Pour it out. Whenever it is, share it. The deeper your prayer, I think, the more room God has to work in you, the deeper that God can touch you, the greater your relationship with him. You know, prayer is a human impulse. It's true there are no atheists in foxholes, and I'm told there are also no atheists in church nurseries either. <laughs> help me, Lord, help me. Second, God does hear prayer. And you will know that over time because things do change and you will change. And third, one of life's great lessons and the lesson to emphasize today, pray from your deepest depths. Pray from your sincerest self. Pray from your dearest dreams because there is a God who does hear, who does care, who does answer and more importantly, who will touch you with his grace. Amen. Amen. Holy God, we lift ourselves to you. We come to you. We might be standing or kneeling or sitting or lying. We might not know what to say, but we come to you, Lord. Hear us. You are not only our Savior, but you are our rock and redeemer. You are the gracious one who grows us in your image. And we pray that as you do that, that we might then be a blessing as you have blessed.